Cincinnati's Rock Legends continues on Star 64. First meeting with Harry Carlson was, was at his photography studio in a, in a room where he took his pictures. And I brought in just a little amp and my guitar and no band and played some bars in Memphis. And he looked at me and he says, hey Lonnie, would you like to record that song? And I said, I don't care. So we recorded it. And that was the first meeting with O'Harry and uh, we went on to be best of friends. They told me up in uh, Minneapolis was playing a job that I'd got a four-star rating in Billboard on my song Memphis. And I, I said, what's Billboard? You know, I didn't even know. And especially, I didn't even know what a four-star rating it sounded like. It must be good, you know? So I had no idea. So I said, well, maybe I should call up Fraternity Records and see what's going on. So I said, hey, so I've been trying to find you at, know who he's at and whatever. You got a number one record and this and that. I said, really? Well, that's great. But I remember when Memphis came out, every time that came on the radio, I'd crank it up, and boy, what a great record. Great record. Lonnie Mack is just a wonderful talent. Memphis, an instrumental climb to number five on Billboard's Top 40, and was often referred to as the sound of the summer of 63. Lonnie Mack went on to have a fabulous career as a guitarist playing with legends like Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Bob Dylan, Roy Orbison, Eric Clapton, The Rolling Stones, and The Doors. The one gold record back here is the one they gave me for playing with The Doors. And I played bass, 105 takes on the Roadhouse Blues and ended up taking take two. I had a blister this big on my thumb. <laughs> Well, I've hung out with presidents, you know, I mean, of all people, I knew President Nixon, and he came to a few of my shows, and uh, I've hung out with, you know, the Rolling Stones, I've hung out with Bob Dylan, and they've all came to my concerts. I've been fortunate in a lot of ways that I never made it real big as in the, in the general public's eye of selling 10 trillion records, but I've made it real big with a lot of the entertainers. As, as being someone they respected, and I feel very honored about that. Lonnie Mack is probably, if not the, one of the best guitar players in the world. Uh, Lonnie Mack is, in my opinion, I don't think Jimi Hendrix could carry his lunchbox. Lonnie Mack is, he is a legendary guitar player. He is absolutely one of the greatest pop guitar players that ever lived. I made a lot of money, spent a lot of money. I've been rich, been famous, and all that other stuff. But when it comes down to it, you know, it, it, it's not all that that really matters. What matters is your friends. I got a lot of friends all over the world, and I can go out as long as I live and still make a living if it's out of the trunk of my car, you know because I got friends, good friends. WSAI in the early 60s was, was the most exciting radio station that, that you could imagine. It was, it was right there. The, the term today, I guess, is cutting edge. But that was, without a doubt, the finest top 40 radio station uh, in the country. Even to the point where, I mean, the ratings showed it. The, the station had an overall 42% share at one point, which was just awesome. We just blew everything away. Uh, there was no competition, and, and there was no, nobody else playing the hits. We just played 40 records over and over and over, and it was phenomenally popular. It was just a wonderful place, and, and, and the DJs, uh, we call ourselves the seven good guys. Uh, we all hung together. We interacted together. Uh, we managed to put personality into a station that, that was, was just playing music and did it in just a, a fabulous way. It was fun. The Beatles were, were very big here almost from, from when they started. It was right after Christmas time in 1963 when we got our hands on the first Beatle record and, and started playing it. And the response was, was immediate, it was literally immediate, to the point where one night, just on a whim, I said, let's start a fan club for the Beatles. And I think we wound up with over 25,000 members. Capitol Records uh, agreed to pay for the, the Beatle club cards. And, I've still got a few, and there's people that whenever when I go out, uh, people will have the club cards, and they'll show them to me. They've kept them all these years. But in February of 64, uh, some of the DJs were out, 
uh, for the evening. I was back at the station doing the show, and they had decided to, to send a telegram to England. Uh, the, the, with the Beatles, were, there was some talk of a tour, and I'm not even sure if, if they had locked it up yet or not, but they said, let's try and get it. And they came back to the station that night and said, uh, if we do it, are you in? And I said, sure. And uh, so they, off goes the telegram. And then we promptly forgot about it until about a week and a half later when, when a telegram came back and said, you got him. And, and we looked at each other and said, what do we do now? Uh, we had the hottest act in the world coming to Cincinnati on August 27th. And I mean, the buildup was just, just incredible. It was, the, it was just a, a wonderful time, and, and it just kept building and building and building. But that had to be the coup of, of, of the year, the coup of the decade. Uh, where uh, DJs were uh, involved. Because in most other places, it was private promoters that had, had got them. But we sent a telegram, and they sent back and said, they're yours, August 27th, Cincinnati Gardens, that's cool, let's go. <laughs> and then we said, wow. We, had, uh, we completely packed the gardens. I mean, it was almost 14,000 people were there. The tickets were $5.50, I believe, apiece. I, that, that number seems to work out with all the math that I, that I have worked through. I think they were $5.50, which by today's standards is a... It's an incredible bargain. We brought him out on the stage, they, and, and the place just exploded. The flash bulbs, I, I, we could have turned off all lights, so the flash bulbs kept going, and, and the noise level went just off the meter. I mean, you couldn't hear a thing. The Beatles returned to Cincinnati in 1966. This time, they were scheduled to play outdoors at Crosley Field. As luck would have it, it rained. Fortunately, the Beatles' schedule allowed them to stay in Cincinnati and the concert happened under clear skies the next evening. 